So we tested giving away Dropbox software for life. That one giveaway alone had already generated, I think around 10 million plus dollars. Deposit photos, our number one deal of all time, I was against. I was like, who buys stock photos? Clearly a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do it differently in my company. So I'm, I'm fortunate I tried so many times to finally get it where I have AppSumo and now I can run it uh, the way that I, I've always wanted. Your side hustle can't be better than your main hustle. Sure. And it's good, like, because a lot of my side hustle stuff now, like this book, YouTube, NoahKagan.com, it's all low risk activities that I can do high risk, high risk experiments on and then incorporate it into AppSumo. This guy was famously fired by Mark Zuckerberg, but he didn't just bounce back. He built a $100 million business. Noah Kagan is well known for his blog, podcast, YouTube channel, and he even shared his story in a book called Million Dollar Weekend. Today, we're diving into a chapter that most founders, including Noah, never talk about. When you start, how do you scale? Noah Kagan is going to share the untold story of how he scaled AppSumo.com into a $100 million business. By the way, this episode is sponsored by our own Scale Up of Scale Ups InfoWeb. More on that later. So Noah, welcome to the podcast. Dude, uh, so glad to be here. Thank you. So glad to have you. So you have a book out, Million Dollar. Uh, weekend. We're, we are not going to be talking about that. Not getting started. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going to be talking about how you scaled up the whole thing, AppSumo, everything else. Um, and I consider you now an investor in our podcast since you did give us a dollar. I did. Um, so you have all the benefits and responsibilities of being our investor. Not and... fiduciary. I do not want any legal yeah. responsibility. Nah, <laughs> sure. It's, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With this combination, nothing, Dude. nothing, nothing. nothing. Um, but I've been following you for a long time. So like blogging and everything else, like Thank uh, you. I, I even consider you more of a creator to point than an entrepreneur. Like, yeah. You're, you're, for me, you're a blogger, now a YouTuber. Yeah. Right? Like that's the thing where, I don't know, I feel that like a lot of people might know you for the content that you produce more than even for Absum, although Absum is a big company. It's a with pretty a large sizable presence. business. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because there's a lot of creators with no businesses, and then there's a lot of business owners with no creation, no like public yeah. personas. And I, I think what I, I realized is that everyone can figure out their own way. Because mm -hmm. I, I was in a meeting, this is two years ago, and I was like, well, Jeff Bezos doesn't have a podcast. And uh, my friend Charlie was like, well, you're not Jeff Bezos. <laughs> you're not even close. You're both bald and buff, you know, and you're both dating Latinas. So there's there's things in common. And a lot of apps, you know, a lot of businesses replicating success. A lot of AppSumo is looking at other models, testing it out, finding what works, and then in, in, uh, investing that. And a lot of our stuff has, has come from Amazon. Mm. And so I've enjoyed being a content creator, but I think where I've mistaken it is I've created a lot of content, not about the business. Mm -hmm. My stuff is more broad market business entrepreneurship porn, but AppSumo is like software creator, solopreneur, techie, freelancer agency stuff, which I'm not doing a good job of integrating both of those. That's something I'm, I'm working on this year. At some point you said like that you have like two personas, the nerdy content, the uh, okay dork side of yourself and then the entrepreneurial side and you kept that separate, right? So how are you feeling now? Are you, because to a point like, are you, are you a creator that has a business like Mr. Beast with Feastables? Are yeah. you Noah Kagan that has AppSumo or the other way around, or is it something completely different? Uh, I think it's both. Mm -hmm. Why not both? Mm -hmm. I, I think in business, we a lot of times think all or nothing, zeros and ones. It's like, it could be a spectrum. It could also be a combination of things. It, what I think you're maybe referencing is I was very afraid in the past of ruining AppSumo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then this is a this is a common thing when you get to like maybe six figures or seven figures or eight figures is the thing that you're doing you're like you don't give a fuck because you're like I have nothing to lose I've got nothing like I don't have anything so mm -hmm. I'm gonna try crazy shit and now that you have something there for instance we're doing AppSumo profiles and our profiles are very vanilla let's just put it leave it at that but that's because now it's like we have to go to the, a lawyer to make sure that it's okay to have certain things and you start toning things down and that, that is a challenge in businesses. How do you keep taking the, the risks and the things that got you to that place and you keep extending that? Because mm -hmm. that's how you keep winning because you're playing offensively, not defensively. What I was thinking about in my own life was, I don't want to risk saying something on noahkagan.com or on YouTube or on Twitter that would jeopardize AppSumo. Mm -hmm. I was just very worried that I'm going to say something offensive. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, in the, yeah, I was going to say something <laughs> offensive and, and it was going to sabotage what I've worked so hard to create. 
And so I wanted to create isolation and silos around my brand stuff. And then AppSumo is a separate thing. But in the past few years, I, I, I feel more confident in myself. I feel, feel more, uh, yeah, self-confident and in integrating that there's just one person. So it's, this is me and accepting that. What influenced that thinking? Well, I left AppSumo and I think that, that was a part of it. So in, in scaling, you really scale up through software people. Mm -hmm. That's it. Whether you're doing an agency business, which most people are like, I don't trade my time for money. Great, hire people to that you trade your money for their time. You can do it with anything. And Eamon, who was our previous CEO, who I hired, quit and I came back. And then I, I think it was just me facing my own fears and me facing like, can I actually be a CEO? Can I be myself? Uh, and is that, a, is that an okay way to do the business? And as I'm doing it, I'm also seeing that the results are there. Like I'm being myself in, on YouTube, on Twitter, in these places, I like it. And it's also, I can see now spilling over into the AppSumo ecosystem where the AppSumo team is even saying now, like we want more of Noah promoting the AppSumo. Interesting. And so versus where I think I used to kind of keep it separate to protect it, it's now actually a bigger advantage really integrating uh, a creator person with the the business that you operate. And I think every business needs to figure out what is their individual person persona, mm -hmm. like their IPP. So, and whether that's yourself, whether that's through affiliates, whether that's someone on the team. Like, I think one of the interesting models is like Barstool Sports. Mm -hmm. I think what they've done really well, which is clever, besides Dave, who's a, a big personality, probably similar to me, he's much more famous, but he's a, a large personality. They've actually diversified to like a girl podcast and a uh, like, redneck podcast and a hockey podcast and so then there's all these other creator celebrities that are brand attention builders and so i think in business it doesn't have to be the one person it can be the intern it could be we have a guy named mitchell who's starting mm -hmm. to do it or nick christensen who's a head of growth so starting to try to branch out so it's not just even noah building the brand but other people building the brand so ivan mentioned earlier that uh he was following you for many years and when he proposed oh we should do an interview with noah do you know him? I was like, yeah, I know him. I've been following you him for years. And then I noticed I do not follow you. I don't follow you on Twitter. I don't follow you on LinkedIn, YouTube, anywhere. But you're always in my feed for years. So, <laughs> sorry. Is this like you came, you came to my house to, <laughs> to yell at I you. apologize. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, are you aware of that? That your, um, your reach is way beyond the people that uh, actually chose to follow you because I was sure I was following you. I'm, I was sh so sure that I know you that I was probably maybe subscribed to your newsletter because I'm sub subscribed to many newsletters. But I was so surprised when I saw that I do not follow you, uh, but you're but uh, you're always in my feed on Twitter, on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how did you manage to do that? <laughs> What's your um, magic? Sorry, I don't know. Like I need to <laughs> no, apologize. I <laughs> no, I mean I think what's interesting about that uh, there's a few a lot of different elements in that. When I would say in my 20s and I got I'm 42 and as I got into my 30s, I was really wanting, especially after getting fired, validation. I really wanted you to follow me. I really wanted more subscribers. I really wanted ego. Yeah. And I still and I still do. I'm very open about. It. I understand. I like attention. And I got a lot as a kid from my mom and I, I maybe wanted more from my dad. And this is a form of that, but I, I just enjoy it. Like there's, I'll do this whether there's a lot of people watching or, or no one. But as I'm getting older, I'm realizing it's less I need people to give me validation for who I am. <laughs> so I think in my 20s, and it's funny when you finally have it, you don't want it. You, you, you don't need it as much. I would say the other pieces of that is that I've, I've also, you know, I've been doing this 20 years, right? I've been doing it a very long time. So... I think it's interesting about people staying relevant for a very long time. Uh, and how do I, for myself, thinking about chasing it less? Like, I, I don't necessarily know if I need more people to follow me to feel worthy. Yeah. I think in the past, I was just like, oh my God, how do I, how do I get, this person has more subs, fuck them, I wanna beat them. <laughs> like, I'm, I think I'm hyper competitive, like abnormally so. But at some point it's like, okay, well, you're gonna always be on the treadmill to try to beat someone else versus how do you start just feeling good for yourself. And so with, with a lot of the content nowadays, it's less about an external number, but for YouTube videos, it's like, can we put out two videos a month that we're proud of? That, and like, look, you follow me or don't follow me, great, but I wanna put out stuff that is so good for people on their entrepreneurship journey. They're like, yeah, you gotta follow Noah because it's unique. And one of the things that was crazy, so for others out there, maybe in the beginning, fine, it's okay to, to chase validation, but at some point, just find things that you're proud of doing for yourself that also, yes, they might get some attention. But if you watch my video or not, like, do I still feel good about it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people do it where they feel so good about it, but no one gives a fuck about them. And so you mm -hmm. do have to have a balance. Um, 
of doing those two things, which is what mostly what you like and, and people want to watch it. What's crazy though is, you know, we have Million Dollar Weekend out and I have a pretty sizable YouTube channel. I've been doing social media for 20 years. I, I love it. I love doing it. Who I get to meet, how I get to learn about communication, how I get to learn about marketing, how I get to connect with people all over the world. It's amazing. It has been interesting uh, with, with the YouTube channel where I put out videos about the book and literally like it's the worst performing videos we've done <laughs> in, in two years, really? <laughs> like the worst performing videos. And so it was a good reminder from a strategic marketing perspective, which is if you're doing things that's getting a lot of attention, and this is where I think most people get wrong in scale in business is like, oh, I have a lot of followers. It's like, you don't have a lot of people that actually care about you though. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's something that as I'm shifting my content in 2024, it's less videos where I'm going and doing knocking on doors and showing people, because people literally don't care who it is. It could be, and most of the other people I've seen who do it are all fake, but it's figuring out, okay, what's my unique thing that only I can do? Just one of one. So my one of one, you know, anyone can be billionaires, but it's harder. And not many people have worked for them like I have, like I, I literally have worked for a few of them. And not many people can do that. And not many people can run AppSumo because there's only a hundred people that work at the company. And so more content related to those types of areas. And so we've been testing it on Twitter and the content's gone crazy viral, like how I run a hundred million dollar year business. There's just only, well, one, most people don't actually have it. They just put it in their titles and you can't see their businesses. They make, they have, you can, uh, which always kind of surprises me, but it's a very unique content. And everyone can think about what's the unique thing that I can talk about, whether I'm starting, like, hey, I'm the, I'm the thousand dollar girl or I'm the million dollar family, whatever that is, and figure out your unique positioning around it. Well, you mentioned billionaires uh, you worked with, you worked for. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, we have to talk about the fact you were fired from Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have to no, talk no. about that. Uh -huh. I was wondering, how are you looking uh, at those days today, but as a boss now, so you're now yeah. the, the boss, the Zuckerberg, <laughs> um, would you fire your, yourself? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've thought about that a lot in, you know, the 20 years. I'm, for everyone out there, we do have to kind of think what's, what's motivating us, whether we're conscious of it or not. And it was so motivating. Really? Oh, having him, him fire me and then Aaron fire me, uh, Aaron Patzer from Mint, was just like, even to this day, I'm still angry at them. Mm -hmm. It's like 20 years later, and I'm still fucking mad. Like I'm in my car playing reggaeton, which is like American Latin yeah, music, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Bad Bunny, you guys know that guy? And I'm just, but it, it fucking pissed me off that they didn't believe in me and that they like discarded me. And I, they also, how they ran their businesses pissed me off. Mm -hmm. And all of that was motivation for how we do things the AppSumo way. Like, we had a guy die at Facebook. It's still, it's still his day. His name is Dan. He died in a freak accident biking. And we literally just went back to work the next day. And I'm like looking around, like he literally died last night, y'all. Like, are we gonna have a ceremony? Are we gonna like build a bike rack? Are we gonna like do a tribute on the site? And there was nothing. And I wanted to do it differently in my company. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I tried so many times to finally get it where I have AppSumo and now I can run it uh, the way that I, I've always wanted. So in terms of firing me, hell yeah, they did a great job. I, I would fire my, my fucking ass in like two seconds. and. I, you know, here's how you know you've, you're scaling well when you're get, seeing the job applications come through and not just the paper resume, but the responses to the questions of the candidates. And there is no fucking way I could get this job here. Wow. Interesting. L like a specific role, we're hiring like a, a business development manager. So they're going to manage the business development associates. These are people that go out and find the new deals for AppSumo. And it's like doing some stuff on Excel. It's a question about how you strategize with interacting with different partners. And I'm like, Psh, nothing. That's a great sign. And I don't have the ego where I'm like better than that. I'm like, dude, yeah, let's find more people that are way better than me. So it was, yeah, and we, I, we've had a few people at the company. We encourage people to have side hustles. I think where Mark and the team were correct, and Mark sat me down about this, was your side hustle can't be better than your main hustle. <laughs> and it, it's good, like, because a lot of my side hustle stuff now, like this book, YouTube, NoahKagan.com, it's all low risk activities that I can do high risk, high risk experiments on and then incorporate it into AppSumo. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not a bad thing. I think it's actually a great thing for people to have low risk environments, low stakes, to try a lot of crazy shit out. For instance, all my emails, I take all of my emails and I literally, the team, this guy named Jay Yang, uh, he's a high school student, I gotta, I gotta shut him out. We came up with this day where you take my emails that we send out each week, he literally copies and pastes them into LinkedIn and Twitter. And it's literally like hundreds of thousands of views on an email we would have just left in an inbox, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. And now then I'm like, oh, that's it's crushing for free. There's not much extra work. So at AppSumo, we're replicating it and we're seeing results. And that was just a little kind of marketing marketing experiment. And so coming back to your question, 
because I try to give people tactics and things they can copy in their own businesses for scale. Yes, I think Mark did a great job firing me. Yes, I think he's done a pretty good job running that company. <laughs> um, I've hired people like me, like Nat Eliason is one of them. There's a guy, Justin Mayers. They both have gone on to do pretty successful things. They were early at AppSumo. And they were they reminded me of me, mm-hmm. where I just didn't want to be at a company. And they didn't want to be at a company. And, and they... You know, luckily Mark made the choice, and with Justin, I think he quit. And Nat, I I fired him. I don't. It sounds aggressive, but I, I let him go. And now Nat's gone on to do good things for himself. I'm interested because in a few podcast interviews, you've talked about like having to scale down the team at certain points, like the pandemic and so on. Mm. As a company grows, firing is part of it. As is uh, hiring. How do you think about the process? Because from what I understand, you do try to understand the people and not. I, I think you phrase it as waste their time, basically having them at the company if it's not for them, right? Yeah. I mean, everyone wants to feel like their life is meaningful. Mm-hmm. You do, you do, you do, everyone listening does. And so how do we help create that at a company? I don't think it's necessarily true companies have to fire. Who says they have to fire? There's companies like in, in Japan, I think they have almost no firings ever, right? And same thing with Europe. To be fired in Europe, you have to really try hard. Mm. <laughs> like it's, it's exceptional, you know that. So the way that, We've had three major team changes and I call our company, I call people teammates. I think employees is like people that just check in and check out. And I do think it's a professional team. So that's why I call people teammates. We've had three, uh, we've had, we went from 20 people down to four. We did with sumo.com, we went from like 60 down to 10. And then with AppSumo, we went from 130 down to 70. And that was, that was maybe four years ago. And so companies evolve and the, the people you need evolve. I think the thing that we've, maybe the thing that others can replicate from that is we really almost exclusively now hire contractors. Mm-hmm. So our hiring is shifted. And the way I encourage people to think about it is how do you hire like AWS? You know, like mm-hmm. everyone knows AWS with servers. Like if you need more, they're there. If you need more, they're less. So for instance, with, with hiring, hiring, <laughs> which is kind of meta, we have a full-time recruiter named Lakin who's great. But right now we're hiring a VP of finance, we're hiring a VP of marketing, we're hiring a business development manager, we're hiring three salespeople, business development representatives, we're hiring a BDA, we're hiring a a marketing project manager. There's like seven roles Mm -hmm. for one Lakin. And Lakin has, there's only so many output of roles that we can allocate based on the time available. So how do you have agencies on tap or contractors on tap so that as you wanna hire more, it's good versus in the past, we had like, I think five or six, we had six recruiters. Mm And then you have to kind of fire because there's no way you can sustain it unless you sustain the hiring. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably the biggest thing for others is how do you get the agencies or contractors ready before you need them or the ability to hire with them uh, in any of these roles? So can you hire a development agency? Mm-hmm. Can you have a Facebook ad agency? And it's easier to then scale with them and then over time decide like, is this an exclusive role we really need to have in-house? And then make that person or someone else uh, an ex- uh, a full-time teammate. Getting back to you working for other co- companies uh, that didn't last for a long time, but while you were still a student, uh, you started um, like a networking initiation for entrepreneurs. Did you already know back then that you're going to be an entrepreneur, or is it that something that just happened along the way? Um, I always I haven't thought about it in a while, but if you think. Entrepreneurship in some of these things, are, there's fundamentals about what you want in your career, right? And they're pretty universal, whether you're a CEO or an employee. Like, what, do, what are the things most of us want? We want to get paid really well, probably, right? Yeah. We want good working conditions. So maybe it, I'd like remote work. I like working from my home. We want to work with other cool people. You don't want to work with dumb, dumb asses. You just don't. Like, you don't work with the dumb dumbs. And you want to work on something that matters to you. So I don't know if that matters whether the CEO, like... If someone can be, let's say Johnny Ivey, he made, I don't know, $100 million a year being an employee. It's a pretty, pretty sweet yeah. gig, you know? I think, yeah. he, I think he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't think it's exclusive to be an employee or an entrepreneur, and there's benefits to both, but it's finding the environment that worked. And I struggled at Facebook, even though it was so cool. I struggled at 150 people the size for myself as an employee. Same with Mint, even though it was four people, like we got up to 30 by the time I, I was fired. And so I kind of had an, a hunch that it's a, the employee path was not for me. And for others, it is. Like I just yeah. got to meet with one of the, who was our project manager, Taylor. He was like, yeah, I love it. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, and he said this line that, was, that stuck with me. He's like, I want your salary, Noah, but I don't want your responsibilities. Yeah, there are people like that. And there's a lot of people like that. And there's nothing wrong with it. He's like, and this is now, it could change in the future. And I would say for me with AppSumo, I want to hire a lot of entrepreneurs. 
And so if you think about like Amazon, they have a lot of entrepreneurs. They have a lot of CEOs. Jeff Bezos is just one of many CEOs. So at AppSumo, Anna, our chief of staff, is a CEO. She ran a banana stand. Alona is a CEO. She's now our CEO. Sean, who's our head, uh, VP of revenue, is a CEO. There's a lot. Chad, the CTO, is a CEO. David Kelly, who runs our originals products, the tidycal.com, is a CEO. We have a lot of CEOs at the business. It's not just me. I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur. My, my dad was an entrepreneur. My stepfather and my mom had traditional jobs. And I just... I saw the benefits and the flexibility and freedom that it was really enabled. And then the upside, frankly, like entrepreneurship upside is literally unlimited. Name another thing that has an unlimited upside that you're in charge of. Like the stock market, I can't control any of that shit. Like crypto, I have to, I don't know, pray to the NFT gods or whatever the hell it is, <laughs> right? An employee, you are limited by the by someone deciding your livelihood. But as an entrepreneur, if as you can eventually find a business that works and there is a process, I, I teach mine, you will get there and eventually you can have an unlimited upside. Just like Jason Free, the USA you know, interview, that guy, he just bought like a $13 million mansion on the beach of Malibu. I read it in the Wall Street Journal, right? From project management software. Yeah. And that guy started as an agency. That he made like 20 years ago. That he made 20 years still ago. Running. You only need one hit in business to succeed. Mm. And there are people like Jason Cohen who've been able to do a few hits. There's people like me who've done a few hits. And there's people like Zuckerberg. He only had one hit. He has not had another hit since Facebook. Like everything he's come up with has failed. Unlucky everything bastard. he's acquired, <laughs> acquired yeah. everything yeah. he acquires has succeeded. And so, yes, he's made a lot of good decisions, but in terms of the success, he's had one. And even that he copied mm -hmm. from other guys, Connect yeah. You, from the Winklevosses. So, the, the, you know, I'd say for entrepreneurship, it, it's an awesome thing and you only need it to work one time over a long period of time to be successful in, in our society. Mm. Talking about limits. Do you think there's a limit when it comes to being scrappy in business as the business grows? Because like a lot of the tactical stuff that you suggest is very, uh, or at least to me, feels very scrappy, like very tactical, getting your hands dirty. Um, but as the company grows, as you get more teammates, et cetera, et cetera, is there a limit between, or is there a change between like being scrappy and needing to scale the business where you can't be scrappy as you were at the beginning as an entrepreneur? There is challenges about that. Like a recent example last week is, we're trying to hire a VP of marketing because that's the biggest bottleneck in our business. We have, we generally have like three things per quarter that are the top three, you know, business movers. And one of them is a VP of marketing. It's like, I'm doing it and I'm distracted. <laughs> I'm doing this book, I'm hanging out with you guys. Like I'm not, think, <laughs> I'm not thinking about it all day long, every day uh, to execute on that. And so because we're a bootstrap business, because we, we are, you know, pretty scrappy, I would say, we're trying to get Lake in and we're trying to get like Angelina, who's on our people team to assist with it. And it's just like, okay, this role alone, let's just take a step back. The VP marketing, let's say we pay them a million. How much do you think they're gonna make for us in a year? If they execute well? Two million, three million, great, okay. So they make three million, we pay them a million, we make $2 million profit. How much is this uh, recruiting firm? Uh, I don't know, it's $30,000, that's a lot. Okay, hold on, so we pay 30,000 and we get two million? That's a pretty good deal. I like I like a good deal. That's why AppSumo.com, number one software deal site online. Um, <laughs> we like good deals. We like finding good deals. We like promoting good deals. We like buying good deals. And so the thing I would encourage people to think about, and, and this applies to every single person you hire currently in your business, mm -hmm. how much are you paying them and how much they generate for the business? Just our straight ROI. And so when you start thinking of it from an ROI perspective, uh, then you can probably spend more money, which is what we have to evolve into. I think you have to consider you doing um, something that you can't back out of. Like if you hire someone, it is hard to fire someone because there's a, a morale cost and mm -hmm. there's a opportunity cost of finding another person. But if it's a recruiting agency, you, you pay 30K, it doesn't work out. It's not that much of a financial hit towards the upside you can get. Now, another way everyone can look at this is do an ROI analysis on the decisions you're doing. So one of, one of our people wanted to get paid more and it was like, all right, how much are you making? You want to get paid more, make more for the company. And then he put a spreadsheet together with our finance team. He's like, here's how much I'm generating. I'm generating like, a, it was like over a million dollars. I think you can give me some incentive on the upside of that. Great. Yeah, I agree with you. Let's mm -hmm. get paid fat. Um, and so the other thing that other people can copy besides do looking at things from a straight, you know, return on investment perspective is start thinking about your principles. And so codifying how you're making decisions in your business. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like we look at things as test and invest. So if you want to hire a marketing agency, is there a way we can test it for $1,000, which is what we did. And then you're like, oh shit, they're actually able to, they have a form that we never use. They have like a modeling that we didn't use. They were able to get a few candidates. Great, let's go further with them. Now that we tested it, they're hiring for multiple roles. Mm -hmm. So that's in our master operating manual, our mom. And so how do you codify and keep evolving your business decision, business decision processes so that whether you or others in the business, they know how to execute on the same AppSumo way? Mm -hmm. You 
our coach and you give a lot of advice for uh, entrepreneurs. And one of the advice you gave is to look beyond your industry when you're finding ideas for mm. growth, for marketing. For example, you said uh, sign up to Toy Factory newsletter or something like that. What is the most bizarre place you found inspiration for yeah. your marketing campaigns? Yeah. Inspiration, it's a lot easier to get inspired outside of your computer, number one. So if you're looking for inspiration, just literally close the technology and, and go outside. I went for a bike ride on Saturday. I literally was just, it's mountain biking, so you have to be in the moment or you, you crash. And, uh, but then you can zone out for like a second. You like go out and come back. And I was just like, the ideas were just hitting. And so just change your scenery, I think is a great way to find inspiration. For me, a few of the recent examples, like for Million Dollar Weekend, we had a book launch party and my my wife had the idea of oh let's look up a baby showers because that's a party yeah. mm -hmm. for kids and so from that we had like one of those fancy balloon arches mm -hmm. we had a thing <laughs> like a uh, she's latina they love pinatas at their birthdays so we got a pinata a lot of that was just looking on instagram for baby shower stuff so looking outside of that i mean absumo we the the number one literally eight figure activity was we saw giveaways in a women's blog. I saw it was a free trip to Italy in a giveaway. Like you give us your email and you can win a trip to Italy. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if we could test that for, for software. So we tested giving away so, uh, Dropbox software for life. And that was that one giveaway alone in 2011. I have to, maybe I should run the numbers recently, but two year, even after two years, it already generated, I think around 10 million plus dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a decade ago. And then we've ran giveaways for the past 14 years because of that one experiment that I saw in a women's magazine. <laughs> and it, it comes from different things. Like even today I saw, a, um, you know, I'm not in the personal finance space right now, but I used to be a little bit more. I saw a guy tweet about the ages, certain people became billionaires. And one of my content buckets is about like longevity. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, that's cool. This is the age they became it, but how long did it take them? And so that was just because I'm like following a personal finance category. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, looking at that, those ideas and inspiration and so on, has has the scale of them changed also as Absumo has scale? Like before you would get give a Dropbox for life. Is it now more? Is it more outrageous stuff to a point? But you look at like Mr. Beast in the early days, it would be like a small challenge. Now it's bigger challenges. Yeah. It's the same thing with like these marketing activities. What I've, a few pieces of scale, which are counterintuitive for me, Number one is that I don't do any more work and that's how I scale. Can right? that, you elaborate on that? So for instance, with Noah Kagan, which sounds weird to talk about me in third person, but me, <laughs> there's a CEO now of Noah Kagan. Her name is Sylvie mm -hmm. and she is the CEO. So we have a goal around book reviews. We have a goal around the email list. We have a goal around YouTube subs and she is now the CEO of how do we get there? Mm -hmm. And I am her assistant. And so she is taking the day-to-day -day responsibilities of what show should I be going on? Are the emails scheduled? Do we have a calendar? Do we need to do hiring? How is budgeting? And so that is a, a counterintuitive thing within AppSumo, the same, like I haven't done a deal in 12 years. It's like three things that are counterintuitive about scaling a business that I've been surprised with is there's no CEOs. No, sorry, three counterintuitive, <laughs> three counterintuitive things uh, about scale that I think people don't realize is that a CEO doesn't do work anymore. And I remember hearing that a while ago and I was like, what do you mean? So with Noah Kagan, me, which sounds strange, there's a CEO of Noah Kagan. At AppSumo, there's a CEO, right? For this book, I hired Tal Raz, who's the CEO of writing. And then when I started doing the marketing, I hired this guy, Tommy, who was the CEO of all the marketing. So once the book was finished, I let him, with my coaching and advice, really drive how we're gonna promote the book. And so I don't know if people are thinking, how do I stop doing the work? And if I'm doing the work, I'm like, oh, what's the problem here that's happening? Is this a software problem? Is this a process problem? Or is it a people problem? Number two, how do you have less ambitious goals that can compound year after year? And when they're less ambitious, you're less stressed. And when you're less stressed, you're more creative. And when you're more creative, you're having more fun. Mm -hmm. And you just do that year after year after year after year after year, things start really uh, compounding in business. Like Warren Buffett, people never talk about this. That guy's only rich from Geico, straight up. Look at his wealth and all the money, it's just Geico. And it's because he bought the whole business. People are like, oh, he's a great investor. No, he bought one. <laughs> and that one is what gave him all the money for everything else. And it's because he owned a business that kept generating cash and they kept compounding that cash and cash. And then, and yes, he then invested it well, but owning one successful business that was continually growing, which is Geico, is how he's super rich. Uh, and then the last thing that I would say is for critical for scaling up that 
I think people are aware of, but they don't know how to approach it, is just really using other people that have 10,000 hours to cheat. You can cheat on scale because there's no books on it. You have to find the people who are in the operation. Like everyone on YouTube doesn't know shit about scale. They're like, unless they've actually, if it's people that are like, yeah, I'm the VP of marketing at Google, probably has an idea of it. And I, it's not as, it's not a shade on anyone, but it's the people who are doing it are doing the work. They're not on social media. For instance, Rajatish Mukherjee. Rajatish is our uh, advisor and he's on our board. He is the GM. I don't know his technical title, but he's the number one or two at indeed.com. He runs indeed. It's a worldwide 2000 person plus enterprise that he is the person running. That guy knows how to run an operation. He's awesome. He also drives a Honda. You know, he's like, a, he's a humble, amazing human. He's not flexing. He's not trying to brag. And you can go to him and say, hey, I want I was thinking about firing this person. He's like, I wouldn't do that. Why not? Oh, because there's morale hits. Is he surprised? What's your process for it? I'm like, oh, damn, he's done this a lot. Right? He, and he knows. <laughs> he knows. Then we go to another thing and then we go to another thing and then he comes to the board meetings. And so what I encourage people to do is think about the companies that are ahead of them and who is the person in the role of the gaps that they have. So we had operational gaps, Roger Tish. We have marketing gaps, that's Moody Glasgow. We had revenue gaps. So how do you actually do revenue optimization, which I didn't even know what the fuck that means, but basically it means <laughs> how do you get accuracy in your forecasting of your revenue? So we have a guy named Colin Gardner from Outdoorsy, our, our V-Share. Uh, and so there's just different people that have already done those things. And so I think people wanna be innovative and figure it out. It's like, don't, be less innovative. Just have one or two things to innovate on and copy or find the experts in these other categories. While talking about innovation, uh, I want to get back to your advices on growing business. One of the things you did is finding people who are not yet influencers. You call them pre-influencers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, Tim Ferriss was one of them for you. How did you find him <laughs> anyways in that space? Because now he's not a pre-influencer, no. a micro-influencer. And how do you, what do you recommend to people that want to find micro-influencers for their business? Yeah. So. There's two ways, uh, let's say, of paid marketing. Let's say you're doing Facebook ads. It's very convenient because you can go to the, the water spigot and you say, I want to have this many customers turn it on. <laughs> and it's very convenient. But when it's convenient, you pay the full price. Yeah. <laughs> now, alternatively, what you can do is that there are places. There's, there's TikTok, there's Instagram, there's uh, YouTube, there's Twitter, and then there's blogs. And you could just literally Google for the keywords you're thinking about. And what you're looking for is you're looking for the person who is less than 10,000 subscribers, it depends on the platform, that you like their content or they have high engagement relative to the content you're finding. And then those people, no one's talking to them. The problem is it's more work. The problem is, is that you have to reach out to them and it, and it definitely takes more effort to scale it. But the cost, because they never get paid at that point, is just way better ROI because mm -hmm. they don't have market rates yet. But as they get bigger, once they have an ad agency, once they have a sheet, and they're like, let me send you my sheet, you're fucked. <laughs> if they send the sheet, you just know it's not gonna be a good deal. But if you can do this at enough, this is what I did at Mint. This is what I did at AppSumo. This is what I did for Million Dollar Weekend. It is a great way, one, you connect with cool people that'll respond to you. And the, the value you get relative to what you pay is almost gonna always be higher. You do have to think about it a little bit in a VC method where you're probably gonna try 10, 20 of them. Yeah. And then one or two will be these ones that, that are great. That you're like, oh my God, I paid 200 bucks for them to mention me and I got 2000. And then how, can I pay for everything for the next year and lock them in? And it's good for them. They know, these people have never gotten paid before. So for them, it's awesome. And it builds a great long-term relationship. So Tim, I met that way. Pat Flynn, I've met that way. I don't know if we sponsored Ali Abdal. I would have, I'd still sponsor. I love Ali Abdal, that guy's mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, shout out to Ali Abdal, Feel Good Productivity. Go buy his book, uh, follow him on YouTube. Already but, have. <laughs> yeah, so Ali, Ali's phenomenal. And uh, I like how he's also run his business. Uh, but yeah, the pre and we're actually, there's a guy uh, if people want to DM me, I can introduce them to him, where I told him like, how do we systematize this problem? So all the businesses I've started have been my own problems. So it is tough to find him. So he created an algorithm that scrapes YouTube based on certain parameters that basically highlights people who have good content up and coming with like less than 10,000 subs. Nice. So instead of us trying to find it, because we hired a person full time to do it, he wanted to start a business. And I was like, here's a problem I would pay you for just exactly what I teach in the book. He created it. And now we're actually, we're paying him at AppSumo to show us these new influencers within categories that we want. You might have a great email list, just like no one AppSumo, but do you text your users, use Apple messages, WhatsApp, or SMS? If not, you might want to try our InfoWeb messaging platform. It's used by companies like HubSpot, Uber, and even Meta for all their users. More in the link in the description below. 
And one last question. Yeah. Uh, so you've done uh, the the videos with talking to millionaires, billionaires. Uh, I, I feel that you've tried to learn from everybody, like the different lessons mm. from their paths. Are there any lessons like as far as like scaling up Sumo and uh, Million Dollar Week and everything else further that you've learned from these interviews and these talks <laughs> that you might want to share in the next book that you write? Yeah, I, I'm not writing another book. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, the other thing too is if you you know what I teach as well in Million Dollar Week, the same way I, I you know run our businesses is what's the size of your market? Mm -hmm. Like so, Atomic Habits. How many people want to improve habits? Fucking everybody. Yeah. Right. Sleep books. Everyone wants to sleep better. Entrepreneurship book, it's super sexy and we're in a world where everyone's talking about it, but the amount of people that are excited to do it is actually kind of limited, mm -hmm. right? It's maybe, I don't know, 25 million people, 50 million people. It's not, and that's relatively, probably even smaller than that. Uh, so I would consider a book maybe broader, but it, it's a lot of effort. Now, in terms of what I've learned uh, from talking to people in, in my businesses that I've been a part of, I would say uh, what I've observed is most people uh, don't keep doing what works if you're asking for like what I've, I'm observing. And people, this is the shit that's annoying because it's it's not a new secretive thing. I'll give you a secretive thing. Go to YouTube community tab and go do more threads. If people want to experiment with marketing channels that not as, not are being abused by all these annoying marketers, mm -hmm. YouTube community tab, threads. Great, done. <laughs> so now that you got some bullshit stuff out there, what's missing is people don't double down on the things that keep working. The 10 xing of the things that work. They, they know that, but they don't do it. And what that's, that's, if I could boil down absolute success, I would say we picked a model that a business model that people really wanted. It was a high demand product, which most people don't have things that are really in demand. We chose a market that was a non-obvious market that became obvious. And then we really just fucking stuck with it. And we kept doing it over and over and over and over. Like every we've done Black Friday now, 10 years. And our first one, fuck, I don't even know how small it was. Maybe it made like hundred thousand dollars. Last year's Black Friday, the month did eleven million. Mm-hmm. So it's like, holy shit. Okay, but it's because we tested it. I was against Black Friday. I didn't want to, I just think it's too much consumerism. Mm -hmm. I think it's just facilitating people. I love the fact that you think it's too much consumerism and you literally have a company that does deals. Well, and I'll tell you, what, <laughs> the, the reason I know I have a, a good company is because I have a lot of people who disagree with me. Because Anton was then, no, we're not gonna, I, don't, I wanna try it. Okay, all right, at least I'm open to trying. At least, as long as it's not too far outside of our values or too far off brand where I can't, I can't stand for it, in terms of, of who we are, I was like, try it. it. tried it, it crushed. And I was like, okay, I was wrong. Deposit photos, our number one deal of all time, I was against. I was like, who buys stock photos? Clearly a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and so finding these things that are working, and when I say 10X, let me just make it very specific. If you're finding that doing a YouTube video works for your business, like, cool. I'm like, how many are you doing a day? What do you mean a day? Yeah, a day. <laughs> one a day, two a day, 10 a day? Right, and that's what that is really what that, that is meaning is that a lot of times the opportunities are before others find out and you do have to, when it's working, really take full advantage of it before others are aware. Uh, we're all glad to seize the opportunity to interview. I love you guys' hustle. Podcast. I love that you guys are persistent. Yeah. It's, the, it's the immigrant, even though you're not immigrants, immigrants. <laughs> it, it is this, it's an immigrant mentality where you guys just have a lot of heart and hustle and I admire that. Thanks, and Thank we love your content and looking you. forward to, to reading the whole book now. Yeah, awesome. I might follow you now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally, this is my whole day. Thank you, God. You got the follow and you get the book. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode with Noah Kagan. If you want to learn how to scale without venture capital and learn more about it, watch this episode with DHH from Basecamp.